to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, host of the Weekly Worldview, Bible student, amateur comedian. Fred, it's great to be back talking about real science on Friday. That's right. And Doug, we're going to get back into the paper that you submitted to the ICC conference that just ended, by the way. You and your daughter, Nicole, submitted a paper on the moon. We've already done a yes. couple of shows on it, but we need we really needed to get back to it because there's so much great content that we didn't get a chance to get to. Yes, I can't wait. It'll be a blast, Fred. But before that, we've got a we want to make an announcement real quick about the upcoming first creationist hydroplate conference, right? That's right. It's going to be held September 21st to the 23rd. That's this coming September. So we'd love for you to join Doug and I and really an A-list of Real Science Radio favorites. And it's the first conference on creation and the hydroplate theory. And you can attend it virtually by registering today at hydroplate.org. Pretty straightforward, hydroplate.org. That's right. It's going to be all about creationism. It's going to be hydroplate friendly, not necessarily hydroplate exclusive. That's we right. invite others. Yep, absolutely. absolutely. So that should yeah, be a lot of fun and really looking forward to that, Doug. So we actually, before we get started on your moon paper, we have this quick creation science headline, Doug, and I think it might be another guy that doesn't know it, but he's working for Walt Brown. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It, it, we're going back to Enceladus, right? Enceladus. Yeah. Now, Enceladus, that's one of Saturn's moons. And so NASA has reported that Cassini spacecraft found phosphorus, which is crucial for life. So this is what Frank Postberg said, who, who led the new study. And this is published, by the way, just here recently, last month in the journal Nature. He said, we previously found that Enceladus' ocean is rich in a variety of organic compounds. But now the new result reveals a clear chemical signature of substantial amounts of phosphorus, phosphorus salts inside icy particles, icy particles, by the way, ejected into space by the small moon's plume. It's the first time this essential element has been discovered in an ocean that isn't on the Earth. Yeah, isn't that cool? I, and I want to quote here, Fred, from Walt Brown's book, In the Beginning, has a big picture of Enceladus in the book. And underneath the picture is the caption. It says Enceladus captured asteroid. Asteroids are icy and weak. So those captured by a giant planet experience strong tides and tidal pumping, generating considerable internal heat, melted ice, and boiled deep reservoirs of water. Because the materials for asteroids and their organic matter came recently from the Earth, water is still jetting from cold and Celebus's surprisingly warm South Pole. And now they've found phosphorus, too. Yeah. They just keep working for Walt Brown and don't know it. It's awesome. That's right. So, yep. Doug, we're going to now we're going to dive in to the rest of your uh, paper that you submitted to the ICC on the moon. We're going and back to the moon. We're back to the moon. And there's been a lot of cool stuff about the moon. If you go back to last week's show from Creation Magazine, it's really cool how the squid creates his own moon while he's, you know, swimming in the water. So all life underneath them just thinks it's the moon. It doesn't know there's a squid there that <laughs> might eat them. <laughs> so anyways, I really like how you, what you did was you looked at some of the creationist theories on the moon. And, for example, you cited Michael Lord's 2012 response to comments on the asteroid hypothesis of dinosaur extinction. You also talk about Wayne Spencer's, quote, our solar system balancing biblical and scientific considerations. And that was published in the Proceedings of the International Conference on Creationism back in their 2008 conference. And then there's, of course, Walt Brown's In the Beginning 8th Edition, and finally, Danny Faulkner's 2014 article, Interpreting Craters in Terms of the Day 4 Cratering Hypothesis, among others, Doug. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, and, and so we started, we did a number of secular theories, which were, again, it was mostly just for entertainment because it was kind of a, it was kind of funny just to go through some of the crazy ideas that they came up with at some of their secular Origins conferences. And 
we wanted to go into the biblical creationist theories. And in the original paper that, that we submitted to the ICC, we only listed them very briefly thinking, well, we don't really want to bore the reviewers with stuff they've already read. Well, it turns out that was a big mistake. <laughs> we should have, we should have delved much further into the creationist theories and the reviewers at the ICC, they said, you know, we should have gone into at least as much detail on the, on the creationist side as we had on the secular model. And in hindsight, of course, we agree that we should have. And so yep. in the paper that we'll be handing out to the attendees at the conference, uh, we have included a great deal more detail than was in our original ICC submission. But our point on the creationist models was that each of them has uh, shortcomings that require a more complete explanation, which we try to offer in part as best we can, even though we're more Bible students than scientists, that's for sure. Way more. We're not degreed professionals or professors or PhDs or anything like that. We're just Bible students, but we want to try to answer some of what we thought were shortcomings, even in the creationists' theories. Yep. And so, and Doug, don't sell yourself short here. You're, you've really shown a real propensity to understand the science. I read the entirety of that paper. I thought it was outstanding. A lot of, you know, a lot of really good science in it. Um, unfortunately, uh, we did, we didn't have a lot of time to, you know, answer uh, questions or, uh, you know, address comments like you mentioned about, you know, providing more details on these other creation models. Yeah, it was a I'm challenge. Not, yeah, and I, I almost, from my perspective, it wasn't really a mistake. It's more just an opinion on, okay, hey, I, let, hey, how about you offer this? And that makes sense. That's fine. I, I was okay with already knowing that these other uh, theories are, are pretty much well documented. But Doug, you said last we talked about last show that we did on the moon that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Right. And you know, it's that famous adage about modeling and it can be perceived by some at some, in some circumstances as an overstatement. For example, I wouldn't make a blanket statement that say flight simulators are wrong. That's a model. And I wouldn't say that it's wrong, but I would definitely say it has uncertainties and shortcomings. And you certainly aren't going to get a pilot certification by a simulator alone. That's not good. Um, piloting you know that community recognizes that but it is a useful that one is a useful model um now there are many models doug that i believe are totally wrong and you know i, I was trying to think of an analogy and just think of a rock that has a squiggly line in it and you have to study that i mean it could it could it be naturally made could it be man-made and so you come up with some kind of idea and then maybe with that idea, you dream up a numerical model. You've come up with a way that, okay, how this thing started, and now you're going to try to model it, maybe how fast that little squiggly line was formed. And whatever you come up with, if your model appeals to miracles, it's never going to make it out of the starting gate. If your model doesn't appeal to miracles, at least it has a chance to get into the realm of plausible. And so... It's important to recognize when, you, when you're dealing with a model to look at things like this and things like validation. Doug, you've, I'm sure you've heard of the whole Ocean Gate thing that happened in the news. I've been kind of fascinated by that whole episode. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I was watching a documentary on it. And really that one of the biggest problems with Ocean Gate was they refused to get certification. And what is certification? It's a way to validate. It's like a really rigorous validation procedure that they just refuse to do and models in the engineering world a model is an important aspect of a model is the ability to validate it that's one of the many important criteria if you can't validate a model it's pretty much worthless so you have to have some means of having some way to validate it now it gets tricky with flood models like with walt brown's flood model there are things that you could model, and they, for example, uh, um, liquefaction. Walt Brown and uh, Brian Nickel, by the way, they both created apparatus that showed how this can work. That's a way to validate something. When you have challenges and other types of validation, like you can't really do what's called a black box validation of some of this stuff, 
you look at the predictions. Predictions are the hard currency of science. And so that's another way to at least get some validating data on a particular model. And so, Doug, when you look at, say, a theory or a model, you investigate the uncertainties of this particular idea and you determine whether or not it substantiates or disqualifies the theory. And anyone who has such an idea or a theory has to be prepared for it to be disqualified by the evidence. Right, exactly, exactly. I mean, Fred, the hydroplate theory, it hasn't answered every question, but it's answered more questions more convincingly than any other theory I've heard to date. I mean, in my opinion, it offers the most credible starting point to explain why the moon looks like it does. And, and so a lot of what we present in the paper relies heavily on the hydroplate model. But we highlighted questionable aspects of all the theories that we cited. Yeah. So I like how you point out that Genesis lays out creation so plainly that really a child can understand that on the fourth day, God created the sun, which was to rule the day, and the moon to rule the night. And although there isn't a detailed description of God's method of assembly of the heavenly bodies, we know that it was orderly. I mean, I love Psalm 33, verse 9, that he spoke it and it stood firm. Amen. And mm -hmm. to me, that's a description of an orderly and rapid creation of or, or an assembly of the entire universe, including the bodies in our solar system, such as the moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and Fred, while, while all credible creationists oppose Big Bang cosmology, they do believe that there was some major catastrophic event, uh, like the late heavy bombardment, some sort of bombardment that impacted the moon. We cite significant creation researchers like the folks you mentioned, Michael Ord, Wayne Spencer, Walt Brown, who all hold to a flood model, a flood-related timing, I should say, origin for that impact event that event that impact event those researchers say it was related to the flood itself and then we address danny faulkner's day four bombardment theory as well in some detail yeah and so that's going to be super interesting doug i particularly like the fact that you're not appealing to any extra biblical miracles you know it's something that henry morris said there's probably something wrong with your model if you're if you're immediately appealing to miracles. The model that yeah. doesn't do that is likely going to be the most ha have the best chance of entering the realm of plausibility. So, right, right. I getting like that approach. That. As an yeah, just from an engineering that. point of view, Doug, I like that approach. Yes, yes. Well, so because you know, as best we can tell, the certainty of a meteoric bombardment is not in question. Um, it's the what, it's the why, it's the when regarding the impactors that either go inadequately answered or they're miraculously explained away in the creation theories that, that we've reviewed. And so hmm. let me just get into from the paper some of the creationist theories. And we'll also get into the scriptural record if we have time on the show. Um, to properly answer the question of why the moon looks the way it does, it's important to start at the very beginning at creation. Yeah, so Genesis 1, verse 16, and God made two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. Yeah, Genesis, like you said, it lays out creation so plainly. Even a child can understand God created the sun and the moon on day four. And like you said, there's not a detailed description of exactly how God did it. But it was orderly. The, the assembly of the universe was not chaotic. It was not dangerous. And all the bodies in our solar system would have been created in a systematic, orderly, peaceful, peaceful way. Okay, Doug. So let's take a look at one of the ones you included. And, and you say that Spencer, Wayne Spencer, he invokes the plausible idea that events related to the fall set in motion naturalistic events that trigger a later bombardment. 
but that he really he doesn't adequately account for the source of this bombardment. He says, quote, we do not know how the impact bombardment of the flood event took place. Right. And that uh, that it could be possible that how the event took place could make factors other than surface area or gravity when comparing crater population against that of the moon. So Spencer was basing his idea that there was a massive amount of impactors that must have hit the earth based on how many impactors obviously hit the moon. But then he says, well, there may have been other factors because so many other of so many theorists studying the moon, they've inferred that the number of impacts on the moon should naturally be extrapolated to the likely number of impacts on earth. Doug, that's a metric that may or may not apply. And I think you'll get into that later in your paper, but Spencer continues with this. He says, I agree with Michael Ord that some source of objects outside the solar system that could somehow set off many impacts within the solar system may be reasonable. Right. And I'm thinking objects flying into the solar system. Yeah. Without some theory of why, well, that might seem reasonable to Orden Spencer, but we found that that thinking, we just found that lacking. Mm -hmm. um, he goes on, he says, quote, a large number of impacts during the flood raises questions because there are many effects of so many impacts. And he raises many of the potentially earth-ending or life-ending events that are probable in such a bombardment scenario. Right. And then he adds that the evidence from the solar system suggests a large number of impacts occurred. And then also said that why would Mars have fewer large impact craters than the moon? And I would welcome creationists exploring other possible solutions to these questions. Hmm, okay. Yeah, yeah. And finally, Doug, he writes this. There is a need for creationists to look into scenarios of solar system events that might explain the cratering evidence. Hmm. I think I, we got a book here somewhere that might help with that. <laughs> <laughs> and again, that's all from Wayne Spencer's 2008 paper at the ICC conference, Our Solar System, Balancing Biblical and Scientific Considerations. So I think it's great that you went back and reviewed some of this stuff, Doug. Yes, yes. And, and so there are some of Spencer's thoughts. Michael Ord offers the possibility of supernatural protection of the earth during this bombardment event. He says, quote, 36,000 impact craters greater than 30 kilometers in diameter were produced in Earth's history. This estimate was based on the impacts on the moon transformed to the Earth. Hmm. And as I mentioned before, Fred, that's the model that assumes similar impacts on Earth. And he goes on. He says, quote, it was unlikely that these impacts could have occurred before the flood or afterwards but most likely occurred during the flood year, unquote. But Fred, he fails to adequately account for the source of the impact. Uh, he says, quote, as creationists, we do not invoke miracles lightly, but scripture does say that God was intimately involved in the flood, unquote. So he invokes a miracle. Yeah, and Doug, to me, that's a no-no. I mean, really love Michael Lord, but... He's calling out a miracle that isn't mentioned anywhere in Scripture. Yeah. And he continues, uh, as you document in your paper, one challenge is where the asteroids originated for the flood. I believe that the secular astronomers mentioned above are correct that the asteroids, which are up to 80 kilometers in diameter, for the late heavy bombardment originated outside of the solar system. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But he says, fitting impacts into a very good creation presents a problem if impacts occurred on day four, of course, we agree with that. If the moon and other planetary bodies were bombarded on day four, the earth should also have been bombarded, killing nephish animals, uh, you know, animals with a soul when there was no death before sin. Right. And, and that last part about day four, it, he's addressing a theory from Danny Faulkner mm -hmm. suggesting that the cratering and bombardment may have occurred actually as a part of the creation week. Faulkner says possibly on day four of creation. So let's jump over hmm. to that paper 
Uh, Faulkner's paper entitled Interpreting Craters in Terms of the Four-Day Cratering Hypothesis, published in 2014, Faulkner's paper posits that the supernatural nature of the events of the creation permitted God to assemble some of the heavenly bodies using measures that produced bombardment events. So he writes in response to questions about colliding galactic bodies needing to be related to a judgment by God, which is most theorists assume that, that this bombardment event was related to wrath and judgment because mm. it looks pretty violent, right? Yeah. So in answer to those questions, Faulkner says, quote, the purpose and means of the assembly of the planets had no component of judgment. That is, impacts are neutral, but they could be viewed as either destructive or constructive depending upon the location, timing, and aftermath, unquote. Hmm. Yeah, not a huge fan of that idea. I mean, you you know, you've mentioned about how the, the creation was pretty much perfect by the end of day six. So, and that alone makes this to me just not very uh, plausible. But in the paper, you mentioned how Danny Faulkner presents a good explanation of entropy before the fall and the very good versus perfect argument during and after the creation week. But as your paper points out, he fails to establish how a chaotic bombardment on day four fits with the orderly creation of the universe or why this potentially dis constructive bombardment event extant throughout the solar system should supernaturally exempt the earth. And I just right. have a hard time picturing this as an, a good creation. I mean, I think comets, yeah, they're cool when we look at them at a distance, but they're really just dirty snowballs. That's what people call them asteroids float it's flying around in our solar system that are really big rock piles i don't see a lot of beauty in that i see where we can we can investigate those and find out there's a lot of evidence for the hydroplate theory um but you know <laughs> <laughs> well and, and when they hit things there's destruction it's yep impacts um i i'm not sure how there could be a constructive impact but anyway, that was one yeah. of the issues I had, you know, uh, how everything remained very good from that point, at least up through the fall. How, how's that? And, and, you know, maybe maybe even perhaps through the beginning of the flood after said bombardment could be assumed to have contributed to send debris through the solar systems. And so finally, Fred Faulkner never adequately accounts for a resolution of what what would have had to have been a transient event leading to the day four bombardment and how yeah. that resolution would have left the earth unaffected between day four and fall. Where did all that debris from day four go? And how did it not mess with anything and everything was all very good? Very difficult mm -hmm. questions, you know? Yeah. And he doesn't adequately elucidate the source of the second judgment bombardment at the time of the flood. So he has a second bombardment that is related to the judgment. But where does it come from? Well, he says, quote, the cratering rate for the Earth's moon may have been different from other terrestrial planets or the cratering rate for the terrestrial planets may have differed from that of the satellites of the Jovian planets. Additionally, the cratering rate may have not, may not have been isotropic, but instead have depended upon direction. Yeah, ah, uh, direction. And so that's going to naturally lead to uh, Walt Brown's hydroplate theory. And, you know, Doug, this idea of Faulkner to me is, let's be honest here, it's, it's a guess. That's all it is, is a guess. You're talking about things hitting and, knocking things around and it just doesn't fit with the, you know, the creation before the fall. It just doesn't right, make any right. sense. And, to and, me, it's just I, a wild I, guess. Well, and like what you pointed out, Fred, I really did appreciate. And one of the things I have to thank the ICC reviewers for is sending me back to read these papers a second time, mm -hmm. because I really did appreciate Faulkner's arguments about very good versus perfect and entropy before the fall, I thought those were excellent. It might be a guess, 
it's an educated guess by a smart guy who's who gets a lot of things right, and I really appreciated it. But there's just a few things that are unaccounted for um, in all the theories. And so that's what we're going to try to address. And uh, and we'll get to a few more things here if we have time on the show, you know. Yeah. Um, I'm sure most of the audience is at least somewhat familiar. But, but I'm going to say something that you might find a bit controversial. <laughs> well, Doug, I, I don't think we've shied away from controversial. That's for sure. At well, least, at least to, to the best of my ability, I haven't, you know. So what well, is it, Doug? What is this controversy? Well, the hydroplate theory, as we've read it over the years, has what we perceive as a ticking time bomb. A ticking time super, bomb. Okay. Yep. A ticking time bomb of supercritical water under pressure beneath 60 mile thick crust it's on day six. And Walt wrote in his book in the beginning, he wrote the following quote. Tides in the subterranean water lifted and lowered the massive crust twice daily, stretching and compressing the pillars, thereby generating heat and raising the subterranean water temperatures. The pressure in the 60-mile deep subterranean chamber, simply due to the weight of the crust, was about 372,000 PSI, far above the critical pressure. After no more than 10 years of tidal pumping, the subterranean water exceeded the critical temperature of 705 degrees fahrenheit fred to us this reads like a bomb was already planted under the earth before the fall yeah and i know that's definitely been a, a point of contention and you know really good discussion i think on that whole idea of a ticking time bomb right and, and fred so if you're if you're a traditional calvinist you just say well god knew so he planted a bomb <laughs> yeah but <laughs> So we, we, don't, we don't follow that, and so we've had a problem with that. Yeah. And so, Doug, as you note in your paper, you then quote Walt Brown, where he writes, as temperatures rose throughout the chamber before the flood, the water became super critical, so it dissolved certain minerals such as quartz within the granite ceiling and the floor. Heat continually generated in the subterranean chamber by tidal pumping raised the crust temperature, but only so much. Eventually, heat escaping into the atmosphere and ultimately into space equaled the heat generated in the chamber so there were no further temperature increases, a situation called steady state. So maybe there's this condition set up that's uh, in case there is a fall. So Walt Brown goes on, that state was reached without pressures or temperatures that would cause a crust to fail. Therefore, it was either man's sinful actions or inactions or a direct act by God that later caused the crust or the pillars that are talked about in the Bible to fail. Right, right. And so that much we understood. And I think Paul was right here, but that there's a, there's a bridge too far in what he wrote, I, I think. Okay. Once the water was super critical, taking into account the Earth's atmosphere, and the crust of the earth, as we understand it today, there would be no way that the heat and the pressure would reach a steady state. There would, there's no way it wouldn't be a ticking time bomb. Now, Fred, we can't dispute the physics of the explosive power and the heat transfer behavior of the supercritical vapor during you know, the, the hydroplate rupture and the explosive release from the fountains of the great deep. I mean... After all, Dr. Brown received his degree from MIT while yep. working specifically in the discipline of heat transfer. Yep. But, but Fred, without an, without an adequate explanation as to how a steady state could indeed hold steady indefinitely and how an inevitable catastrophe could be avoided since, according to Dr. Brown's section titled What Triggered the Flood?, Water would have reached explosive, supercritical temperatures just 10 years after the creation. Fred, should sin not have entered? Well, I mean, we're just left asking how God could call this inevitably catastrophic situation very good on day six. Again, I think that's a fair, definitely a fair point to make. So this is a part where, again, there's some contention or at least more digging into and, and I don't know if he offered anything beyond his statement that you mentioned here. Either man's sinful actions or inactions or a direct act of God 
later caused the crust or pillars to fail. But Doug, you, do you think you have an answer? Well, I, I don't know that I have an answer that goes much beyond what Dr. Brown said right there. But I hope that what we've that what we present will give other people uh, with the credentials and the skills the ability to figure out maybe more accurately exactly what that was all about. But Fred, mm -hmm. I think we're about out of time. And so we're probably going to have to come back. I hate to leave everyone on the edge of their seat, <laughs> but we'll have to come back. Yeah. Well, it's definitely a fun topic when you talk about, you know, there's really good discussion on this whole ticking time bomb thing. This isn't like a straw that you pull out and the whole theory crumbles. But it's something oh, no, that, no. that, as you mentioned, as you you address this in the paper and fairly so, I think it's cool that you mentioned it because, it, you know, it is something, again, a good topic to talk about. And unfortunately, it sounds like we are running out of time on the show. And, well, and, and real quick, Fred, before we go, every hydroplate advocate that I've discussed this with, and I believe I've discussed it with probably the, the people who know more about the hydroplate theory, aside from Walt Brown, I've talked with the people who know it as intimately as anyone. Mm -hmm. And they've all admitted, yeah, this is a bit weak. And so there's... Uh, there's some work to be done, and uh, I look forward to sharing with you what we've done on it. Yeah, definitely. So we'll get to a moon show part four next week. And we'll also, at that time, Doug, we'll be done with the ICC conference. It'll be fun to report on you know, all the goings on there. I'm looking forward oh, yeah. to doing that. So, Doug, what a paper. This is awesome. So, Doug, can we provide a link to your paper on the website? We will do that. Yes, we okay. will get that posted. We're, we're putting it down into a, a format that a civilian can read. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. Yeah. And I, again, I, I haven't read your paper since you sent it to ICC, but I, I read your last draft. So I have not had a chance to read um, alterations since the ICC, other uh, reviewers had recommended some changes, which unfortunately, because of, uh, I believe there was definitely some health-related issues with some of the, uh, uh, I think, with the person who runs that conference. Everything was yeah. really running late, and so there just wasn't an opportunity to really address some of this stuff before the conference. But it's nevertheless a fantastic paper. Um, we encourage people to, to go out and read it. And if you find anything that you think isn't right, let us know, because I know Doug would yeah. like to correct those, but there's so much good documentation. And the moon is a fun topic to talk about when you're talking about the hydroplate theory, because how do you explain, you know, how the moon is so pockmarked? And right. the I don't like theories that say that, well, it was pockmarked from the beginning. That just doesn't sound like a perfect creation to me. Um, no, not an orderly creation, not yeah. a very good creation. Yeah, and I don't like the ideas of other things flying around space, you know, after the, it, I guess it's possible after the fall, but it, it just makes a lot more sense to me that this stuff came from the judgment on Earth. Earth was judged. It's not just man, but the creation itself is groaning. Right, and, at and, the time and, of the flood, exactly. right. Exactly, and so it makes a lot of sense that you that this stuff came from the Earth, as the hydroplate theory talks about, and then you find all this evidence in the solar system. Rob Brown has documented trans-Neptunian objects and how they, they can't have originated outside our solar system. You've got that Earth rock on the moon, Doug, that, oh, by the way, NASA says, that rock looks like it came from like 20 miles beneath your surface in a watery yeah. environment. In yeah, a watery right. environment, Doug. That that sounds like the hydroplate theory to me. I, I don't know. A child can understand Genesis and how it's written its history and can understand it. And a child can understand if you find an earth rock on the moon, maybe that rock came from earth since it's an <laughs> earth rock. How about so. that? <laughs> okay, so Doug, we'll get to the rest of your paper next week and also report on the ICC conference. So for Doug McBurney, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you. Mm -hmm.